present a few things. You can come up with some questions that you might have about medications. Uh, today is going to be a two-part presentation. The first one is just to get you talking about medications as they pertain to you, as they pertain to your loved ones, as they pertain to anybody that, that you care about. And then the second piece of it is going to be uh, for, what do we do in pharmacy in an inpatient, hospital inpatient setting and how we move how we move drug up to you and, and where you can see that we're making a difference or where you can see that maybe we can help you a little bit better. So the first one that I want to talk about is, let's talk about medication. So here's a question for you. How many prescriptions do you think um, the average person age 45 and older take every day? Prescription medications, not including your vitamins, all that. So happily we're still only around four. That's good, but don't don't include your vitamins. Okay, now what happens when we bump that age up to 65 and older? No, it's nine. Now it's nine. You're exactly right. It's nine prescription medications. So that's a lot. Okay, now what percent of older adults age 65 and older skip doses or don't fill their prescriptions due to the cost of the medication? It could be as high as C. They know for sure it's at least 25%. But it could be as high as C because we don't really know what people are doing when they get home. Are they half tabbing? You know, are they just skipping every other day and hoping that works? Sometimes we know that patients don't fill their prescriptions at all because they don't get any benefit and they're right back in the doctor's office three weeks later and saying, how come, how come I'm not better? Okay, so those are, those are some important things to think about. About 1.5 million Americans every year suffer preventable injury, illness, or death due to mistakes made in prescribing, uh, dispensing, or taking prescription drugs. Uh, there's been a, public, a paper published, oh, I don't know, probably almost a decade ago, that said um, that the same number of people that could fit on a 747 were dying every single day because of medication errors. And that paper went on to say, if that was the airline industry, what would happen to the airline industry? it would shut down, right? And we're not shut down. So, and there's lots of players. And so it's not always, it's not always one person's fault. In fact, it's rarely one person's fault that we have a medication error. It's usually a systems process where there's lots of things along the way and something breaks down or several somethings break down. So, the reason I highlighted those in different colors is so that you could see that prescribing is an issue, dispensing is an issue, and even when the patient gets home, they're taking the medications um, can be an issue in this, um, in these, in these problems. Um, I stole this from AARP. <laughs> it happens to be one of the ones I've seen that lo that looks really good. But this is a personal medication record, and we've been talking here locally um, with a group of people that are talking about getting a file of life started, and so they're going to have something very similar. But my re personal recommendation to you and to anyone that, that you love or care for is to get those medications on a piece of paper, something they can grab when they just need to run to the hospital or something they can keep in their wallet that they have on them at all times. I can't tell you how many times patients are brought in unconscious and they can't communicate. And even if they could communicate, how many people have you talked to that actually know what medications they take? They say something like, well, my wife has the list. Oh, okay, but your wife isn't here. How is that going to help you? And so I recommend putting everything on here, all prescription medications, your over-the-counter medications, even if you use them rarely. If you use dietary and herbal supplements and vitamins, that needs to go on there too. We can have a lot of drug interactions in that department. And then ideally, if you can get the person you're working with to put the dose on there and how often they take it, that's, that's even better. At a minimum, it's great to have a name. On the back side, what it looks like is there's a place to put every every drug, the reason you're taking it, how much and how often, when you started and stopped it, or any type of special instructions. And this is a fantastic tool that the patient should be taking, we, and, and we ourselves as patients, should be taking the impetus to do for ourselves and for our loved ones so that anywhere they go, um, they have, uh, healthcare professionals have access to what this person has been taking. And then I just wanted to go over you, with you just real quick so that you'll be, you're pretty familiar here working in the hospital, but keep in mind the people that you, uh, your loved ones, your family members, they may not know how to read a prescription label. The most important thing on here for a patient, 
a patient to know is, is the SIG, and it tells them how to take something. Now keep in mind, SIGs are written by people, and sometimes what makes sense to one person doesn't make sense to somebody else. So when you pick up your prescription, and it's the first time you've picked up that prescription, look at your SIG. Does that even make sense to you? And then if it doesn't, talk to the pharmacist and say, uh, put that in English, please. I can't understand this. It makes no sense to me. It should have the drug name on it, whether it's generic or brand is fine. It needs to have the dose on it. It needs to know the doctor who prescribed it. It needs to tell you how many you're getting in that quantity. It needs to tell you the pharmacy that filled it and their phone number because there's any number of things that could happen to you. And the first person you should call is, is the pharmacy and say, oh, by the way, is it normal that I can't go to the bathroom <laughs> anymore? <laughs> that could be an issue, right? So they can t at least troubleshoot the side effects. The other thing that I really want you to do when you go pick up a prescription is I actually, um, well, actually, we'll talk about it in just a second. Let's talk about what you should do before you go to your doctor's visit. So when you go to a doctor's visit, you meet with a, a lovely, nice person, usually a medical assistant, who says, well, tell me what medications you're on, right? And so you rattle through those. How much training does a medical assistant have? Does a, has a medical assistant ever had a pharmacology class? Probably not. So you, as the patient, need to be very responsible, and you need to say, here is how you spell that drug. This is the dose of that drug, and I take that drug twice a day. And the reason this is so important is because this is the very first step in miscommunication between physicians' offices and hospitals and pharmacies. She might write metoprolol 25 micrograms three times a day. Well, metoprolol doesn't come in micrograms. So what, what are they talking about? And what if she t picks the extended release versus the short-acting release? So it is in your best interest to make sure that you maybe hand that person a list that's already typed up and say, this is what I'm on, or you just make sure they get it right so that misinformation doesn't start there. So you should bring a list of all your current medications, and then you should ask uh, questions about your particular situation. Now, I'm guilty of not doing almost all of these. I went to the doctor, I kid you not, last Friday, and I forgot to ask some of these questions. <laughs> what is the name of the medication you're prescribing me? Sometimes they say, well, I'm going to give you a little something to help you breathe. Well, what's the name of it? So I can recognize it when I go pick it up at the pharmacy. Um, what is it supposed to do? Well, you said it's supposed to help me breathe, but how is it supposed to help me breathe? What are the side effects that the physician knows about that you should be looking for? When do I start and stop this medication? Oftentimes we're handed a prescription and it's assumed that we start on it. Well, we have millions of people in America who are continually on medications they should have stopped a long time ago. But it gets passed from physician to physician to physician and pretty soon we are under the assumption it's a maintenance med when in reality it wasn't supposed to be. So we need to make sure we're asking about stopping. Also, how do I take this? If you've never had to have um, either an in inhaler or a nebulizer before, how do you do that properly? In the physician's office is a good place to start that conversation, and they can usually give you some tips and tricks. And there, are there any other non-drug actions I can take? I think as patients, we forget about this one. We live in the age of modern medicine, which seems miraculous. But really, if there's something non-drug we can do, should we be doing it? Probably because that might, give us, um, that might give us some help that we can do without putting our bodies at risk of a medication. Okay, another thing we can ask is, is there more than one prescription that could be used to treat my condition? If so, how do they compare in safety and efficacy? So we kind of make a joke in pharmacy land that the doctors are prescribing whatever the latest rep brought to them. And that's not entirely true. They're smart people. They know their way around it. But be mindful of that. Be mindful that there's trends, just like in fashion, just like in cooking. There's trends in medicine. Do we all need to be following those trends? Sometimes there's a good reason, sometimes not. So be sure to ask those questions. Okay, and then you go from your doctor's office to your pharmacist. And guess what? The same questions apply. What's the name of this medicine? I don't know how to say that. Say it again. Sulfamethoxazole trimethoprim? Oh, I can call it Bactrim? Sweet. Okay, good to know. So what's the name of the med? What's it supposed to do? What's the side effects? This is the person. This is the queen of side effects right here. She'll tell them all to you and more than you wanted to know. When do I start and stop taking it? How do I take it? So this list is exactly the same as when you go to your physician's office. Here are some recommendations I have. Um, pick Try to pick, this is not always possible, 
try to pick one pharmacy for all of your needs. The reason is because that pharmacy will have your allergy information on file. All, all pharmacies will. But what they can't do is they can't compare drug interactions if they're not filling all of the medications. So you try to let them know the other medications you're on. It just kind of creates a little bit more walking and effort for you. At the same time, to be honest with you, if a drug is on Walmart's $4 list and you can get it cheaper there, but you prefer getting the rest of your meds over here, I'm fine with it. Just make sure that that's on that list of your medications so that when you end up in the ER and we're doing a med history, we don't accidentally somehow miss that you're on Coumadin because that was at Walmart, but it wasn't at Smith's where we called. Okay? So I also prefer, if you can, go to the pharmacy in person. Get to know this guy. Get to know him. Make sure he knows your name because you want him looking out for you. Um, I want you to open your bottles right there at the pharmacy. You're picking them up, you pop it open, whoa, that's not what I had last time. Because guess what, pharmacies can't take your pills back. So you make sure that's what you had last time, that it looks the same, because that's where medication errors happen. Dispensing errors can happen every day of the week, even though, um, even though there's, there's NDC scans, there's visual checks, there's people counting. Quite frankly, there's a ton of white pills out there and they can, they can look differently. So please take a peek at your pills, okay? And then ask the pharmacist anytime you go in, you're just going in, you're not even going in to get a prescription filled. You're going to pick up um, some over-the-counter Zyrtec and you're coming to pick, in, pick up some, some cold medicine at the same time. You're, you're already there, why not just walk over to the pharmacist and say, by the way, I picked up these couple of things, any chance I'm gonna have drug reactions with any of the medications I'm on at home? They can tell you right off the bat, that's their job. They can also help you a ton if you need recommendations of what to take over the counter. Okay, so don't forget, almost across the board we have problems with alcohol and meds, driving and meds, certain foods and meds, and herbs, meaning supplements and meds, can all also cause a ruckus. So if you take any of those, or you're planning on doing any of those, just be mindful and aware that there's probably a contraindication in there somewhere. Okay, we talked about people who don't fill their medications because they cost too much. So first and foremost, consider generic if you've been prescribed a brand. Um, brands can cost an incredible amount of money. A great example of this, um, these are not the same drug, but they're in the same class, and this is a conversation you should have with your physician. Um, so for example, if you're on a very fixed income, and you're supposed to be on an anticoagulant, Coumadin cost is on the $4 list. However, if you want to be on uh, Xarelto, that is more, most assuredly on the $400 list. That is quite a difference in cost. And what you will find often is that many times physicians do not know how much drugs cost. So if you find yourself, in, I would start it in the physician's office and I would say, by the way, it needs to be a low cost alternative because I can't afford much medication much medication cost. And it all depends on your insurance and, and who you have and, and whether you're paying out of pocket. But what you can do that's helpful to you is once you get to the pharmacy, they can run a cost through and they can say, oh, by the way, did you know that's going to cost $400? And you say, whoa, I didn't know that. Please don't fill it. So they run it through. They can just run it through as a test claim. And you can say, well, what are my other options? And the pharmacist can let you know, and that way you can give your doctor back a call and say, that's just not going to work for me. But make those healthcare professionals help you out. Make them give you information that you can use instead of, gee, sorry, I don't know what you're going to do. They have the information and they can help you with that. And also you can research your drug choices. And if you don't know where to go, quite frankly, I find Google refreshingly helpful. And it may not always be on, um, it doesn't always have to be on, on websites that we would use like in a hospital setting. But WebMD is a pretty rock and awesome place to go for some basic information, and then from there you can take that to your doctor's office. So places like WebMD I'm totally fine with using. Um, also just be mindful, the branded drug and the generic drug, I feel like everybody in here knows this, but you may need to repeat this to your family members. Brand and generic are the same molecule. They are the identical molecule. So if you're getting a generic drug, it is identical to the brand. Here's where the difference may actually occur that may actually affect some people. 
the active pharmaceutical ingredient is identical. However, they have to use a lot of stuffing around it to be able to make it big enough to put it into a pill. So the stuffing around it can vary. And that, they call those the inactive ingredients, right? So that's where you see all the funny stuff you can't spell, like methyl cellulose and other weird things that are difficult to wrap around your tongue. That's where it may also make, that's where it may make a difference. Another place where it may make a difference, because people have had this experience, is that when a generic goes through the FDA approval process, they are compounding that drug in a different way than perhaps the brand was. And to allow for variations in chemical, um, in the chemical results, they will let them vary by plus or minus 20%. That sounds like a lot, but if you've ever had an organic chemistry class and at the end of it you're staring down a very long tube at a very tiny crystal, 20% seems reasonable in my view. So what I'm saying is that different chemical processes will get you to the end result, but you might not have quite as much. So that's why sometimes people struggle with a generic and they're like, only the brand works for me. And that's fine too, but just keep in mind you're paying usually more for the brand. And that could have a whole lecture all by itself if anybody's more curious. <laughs> okay, so this is the biggest thing. So let's say somebody actually had the money. So wait a second, let's go back to the beginning. Let's say somebody stopped, started it at the doctor's office. They got a prescription for something that's going to help them. They actually went to the pharmacy. They filled the prescription, and they had enough money to pay for the prescription. And then they get it home. Well, if you don't get the med in your body, it's not going to do anything. So it turns out we have the biggest <coughs> problem with what we internally call compliance. How you get patients to take their meds every day. And I just say you pull out you pull out all the stops. If they need a fancy dancy pillbox, that's perfect. If you need to set alarms on your phone, that's perfect too. Maybe you can take a mental picture of yourself taking that medication so that you get it in your body three times a day. Take it at the same time every day. Does anybody know why oral birth control fails so often? people don't take it. <laughs> and that's why people are like, oh, I was on birth control. How come I got pregnant? Well, because you have to take it every day. So this is something you'll probably have to help uh, your family members with. It's a struggle. And then side effects. Uh, we talked about talking to your doctor about what to expect. We're all of an age that we know how our body feels normally, and we should use that to judge how we're feeling otherwise. Um, Sometimes people forget about that. And if you have younger people in your life, like I have, I have a daughter who um, is 16, and she struggles with taking a pill every day, and then she struggles with understanding how her body felt before she started taking the pill. So she doesn't really have a good frame of reference. So that's a little difficult. You can report back to your doctor. You can call the pharmacy. If you feel bad enough, I would definitely go to the emergency room. Side effects can be very serious. Okay, safeguard your drugs. We've had... Um, Terrible accidents with children. Most drugs look like candy. Poison Control Center in Utah has an amazing board of pills that are identical. Like you can pick one that looks like, um, oh, uh, fer uh, ferric gluconate, uh, the iron pill that's green, looks exactly like a green M&M. &M. And then, um, oh, what's another one? Tums always looks like a sweet tart. You know, and so it's just a really interesting list of things. So don't forget that these look different to kids, <coughs> even if they're in a child-proof container. Child-proof, by the way, means that, oh, I can't remember the exact quote, but it means that only 20% of kids can get into it in five minutes. That's what child-proof means. It does not mean kids can't get into it. So you give them a lot, enough time to wiggle with it, and they can get in. Um, drug abuse with teenagers. Most teenagers, they think now, get started on drug problems by, find, by looking in people's medicine cabinets and seeing what they can take. So if you have anything like that, you need to keep it uh, well out of harm's way. Get rid of your expired and your unused prescription drugs safely. What I should have done when I told you the little story about putting somebody's otic uh, medication in their eye. I did it to my own kid. And then store them according to the instructions. Um, there's a number of medications that have to be refrigerated. There's a number of medications that cannot be refrigerated. So you can't take a one-size-fits-all approach. Just take a look at the bottle. It will tell you. Um, keep them there under the conditions uh, that they're expected to be under. Any questions on personal medication safety or <coughs> recommendations in that area? 
<laughs> it's like preaching to the choir, that one. But I thought I'd remind you because you have families and other people that don't go to the hospital, you know, every day like you do. Okay, so the second one is going to be... Oh, wait a second, we need to start here. Okay, now we're ready to go. Okay, so this is a little bit about inpatient pharmacy. And we're in the basement, and people are probably always wondering what we do down here. And I totally get it, because um, if you can't see what somebody's doing on a daily basis, you always wonder what's happening. So I thought I'd give you at least a little bit of a list of what pharmacy is responsible for. So we're responsible for the hospital drug inventory, which at current is 1,232 medications, uh, more or less. And then if you take that in context of all the medications we talked about that are out there in the world, it's actually a really small percentage. But we can't be all things to all people, and we're, and we're focusing on acute care. So that's why we have so few compared to the, the number that are available. We also provide all the fluids for the entire hospital. So I took a picture of our fluid aisle, and that's just part of our fluid aisle. Sometimes we get pallets dumped in the hall, and we have to take those up to dialysis. We probably run through, let's see, if we count dialysis and we count the ER, we easily run through about 11 to 1,300 bags of fluid a week. And that's for all of our purposes. So, you know, a bag of fluid doesn't look very big until you have stacks and stacks and stacks of them, and then you realize we spend half of our day lugging water around. <laughs> and then we're also responsible for inpatient drug care, but also we do a pretty hefty business in outpatient infusion drug care. So I don't know how many of you know that we see about 200 on oncology patients a month, and we're doing infusions for them. We stock 19 Pixises every day. I don't know what the plural of Pixis is, maybe it's Pixi, but we do 19 of those a day, and we have to stock all the crash carts in the emergency med boxes, which there's a total of 47 that we could potentially use or outdate every month. We make IVs every day, we make chemo fusion, chemotherapy infusions, about 45 a week. That's mostly just Monday through Friday. And in case you didn't know, we have a brand new hood down in the oncology area where we're going to be parking a technician and a pharmacist, which is really exciting so they can get their drugs a little bit faster and we have better communication. Uh, we do medication inspections monthly. All areas of the hospital, you've seen us kind of prowling around, digging for, you know, misplaced meds or expired meds, something like that. And then we go through the clinic as well. And then we're also responsible for appropriate drug charging, drug dispensing, and appropriate drug evaluation. And we staff um, 68 and a half hours per week. Um, plus on call, because you have probably had the opportunity to call one of our, our pharmacists. Okay, so this is our pharmacist in action. And we always joke about this because it always looks like the pharmacist is doing nothing. <laughs> they're in action. They're sitting at their screen, they're, and then the techs come in and they're like, what are the pharmacists doing? Well, I'll tell you what they're doing. So when a pharmacist gets the med order from Dr. Brown, let's pick on Dr. Brown. Dr. Brown sends down a med order through CPOE, which is, you know, our, our online uh, or our intra-computer ordering system. And so it pops up on her screen as a, as a to-do item. Such and such patient wants pantoprazole IV um, twice a day. Okay, so this is Lana, and Lana has to pull up the patient. And the first thing she has to do is she has to check the patient's allergies. Is this patient allergic to anything that could possibly interact with this particular drug order? Then she has to review all the other medication orders that this patient is on. So she literally has to line them up and doogity 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 doogity. She doesn't have a fancy dancy button that says, oh, by the way, these are contraindicated. She actually has to do that from her training um, and, and her experience of what she knows can cause a problem. And then she has to look through all the lab values. So sometimes if we call and we're pesky because we need to heighten the weights because we need to figure out creatinine clearance. And um, there's other times, and we need to look through uh, their electrolytes. We need to look at their liver function. We need to look at their blood glucose. We need to look at their cultures and sensitivities. And we need to look at their fluid status, among other things. So these are the, the top ones that we usually look at. So she has to look at all of that and say, is that appropriate for that patient? And then she also has to look at it and say, okay, so now all of this is fine, we're good to go. However, is that the right med and is it appropriate for this diagnosis? And is it the right dose and the frequency for this particular diagnosis? And when she's satisfied that all of that is good to go, then she can finally click and it can be sent off to either 
the IV room to be made or it can be sent to Pixis so that you can dispense it. And so that's a number of the things that she has to go through. And one of the uh, changes we made recently in pharmacy was we um, asked the technicians to please be picking up the phone because if you get interrupted in the middle of any of this, sometimes you have to go back to the beginning and try and figure out where you were. So we've asked the technicians to pick up the phone and play a little bit of interference because many of those problems technicians can solve so the pharmacists can continue to do their job. Okay. Anyway, I thought this was funny because, see, has he been working out? His brain got bigger. <laughs> I like the idea. It's not working for me. All right, so these are technicians to the rescue. See, we tried to put a super tech uh, thing on the back of Miranda there. So our technicians are really the legs of the pharmacy. They're our inventory specialists. They are in charge of ma making sure that all 1,232 drugs are stocked appropriately. And nowadays, has anybody heard the word shortages? So we have had shortages like crazy. The shortages keep coming and coming and coming, and they don't seem to drop off the list. There's a lot of reasons there's drug shortages. That's a whole other lecture by itself, but very interesting. Um, but Miranda, in particular, is the one who has taken on the task of becoming our main buyer, and she's making sure that we have the stock that we need to take care of the patients appropriately. If we don't, we do a little bit of begging and borrowing, and sometimes when we've hit the end of our rope, we need to go to the physicians, and we need to go to some other departments, and we say, guess what? This is no longer available. What, could, what, what can we do instead? And we give them some ideas. Sometimes they have an idea of their own. They are also the dating experts. Ha, ha, ha. That means they're looking at every single pill and medication to make sure it's within date so that we are not putting our patients at risk of um, expired drugs. They're also the delivery queens. You'll see them in the hall with their little carts, and they're, they're driving to Pixis, or they're, they're going to go fill some flushes, or they're going to go down to oncology, so you'll see them all over the place. They are also our predominant Pixis problem solvers because, as we all know, Pixis is trouble-free. <laughs> That's not true at all. <laughs> Pixis is a big problem. And so they're the ones um, that we often send up to solve uh, the Pixis problems because they have the most experience with it. Okay, and they also have to package every single pill individually. Did you know that? Did you know that every single time we send a pill upstairs, it has to be packaged individually? That's a lot of bottles of 100 that have to go through a little pill machine. So they package those. Did you and change pill machines, or why do we have the different packaging now? Yeah, we changed pill machines. I don't know what happened. It was right before I left, but I have a feeling that the reason we changed was because the other one died. Oh, okay. I think that's probably what happened. Because the new ones are harder to get open. They are kind of hard to get open, aren't yeah. they? I think so, too. It's not my favorite, but yeah, usually usually we wait to haul off and spend a whole bunch of money until we have to. Um, and then they're also our charge masters. So on the back end, say for example, like the fluids that, that didn't get charged because maybe they don't dispense out of Pixis, they, they back up and make sure that the patients are charged appropriately for that. And then there are also our fluid fluctuators. By that I mean they just haul, haul water all over the hospital in, in the form of baggies. Oh, my picture went to the wrong side. Doggone it. Doggone it. See, I was messing. Oh, doggone it. So anyway. Some of the other things they do is they pull, they pull from the Pixis, they make the IV batches, they make the chemo batches. And they're basically, I kid you not, they're the legs. So like the pharmacist might be using what's between their noggins to try to patient, solve patient problems and to get the right head <coughs> to the right patient. But it's truly our technicians that save us. And they're truly the ones that get out there and they're the feet to the fire getting everything done for us. So we really, really appreciate them. So pharmacy is at your service. If there's anything I can do to try to help smooth things out, to help give information, to help actually get anything done, if you'll let me know, that would be great. Anything come to the top of your heads right now, Charlie? <laughs> <laughs> Why am I the only guilty one? <laughs> no, no, you're not guilty. It's good ideas. You have good ideas. Well, what I was, the one thing I was wondering is about is at one point we were going to do our own mix thing, and now we're not doing that again. No. no, we are. We started this week. Okay. We're starting this week. We barely got, oh, that was that was another Pixis conundrum. So this week we started, and so we are sending all the orders up through Pixis. Okay. And, ooh, there's a snazzy pink sheet hanging in your bedroom with all the little different adapters hanging off of it that tells you, you probably already know, but what adapter is for what you're this week. Oh, okay, well, I'll, I'll go show you. That'd be fun. <laughs> It'll be a field trip. Woohoo! 
Yeah, I was just like, okay, are we supposed to make mixing these or not? We're we're not here to forever. be mixing it or not? I know, but I'm excited, so I'm hoping it goes well. So we're definitely waiting for feedback on that to see how it goes. Hey, if you can just get clindamycin, the I do not love clindamycin. That is it's the not biggest my thing. pain in the butt to it mix. Is. I spent time up there with yeah. a cute little gal trying to figure out how we were going to get those two together. Well, I'll be honest with you, I'm probably going to draw it out of the bottle and just inject it by syringe because... Because it just doesn't work well. Uh-uh. Mm -hmm. I've had it. I've pretty much just, like... We think it's because the vial is so small mm -hmm. that it cores the yeah. cores the top and then that I just agree. sucks back in and you can't yeah. access the drug. Yeah, I think that's entirely the problem. That's why I'm, anytime somebody's got clindamycin, I'm like, oh, screw it. I'm just going to take the bottle off and <laughs> do it. And I can understand why you do that. I do. So, does anybody else have any questions, fun pharmacy, random things that occur to you? Wow, that's <laughs> I <had> great. A, <laughs> I had an experience the other day, kind of like what we're talking about here. Went to a, a care physician nurse, so I go to patients' homes, and I go over their medications with them and such. And anyway, I had this lady who's a cardiologist um, from Salt Lake, had written her a new order because of her blood pressure uh, being too high. Um, she has a local pharmacy that she fills up with. She got picked up the bottle. She went home and took her first dose. And um, she also had to, without giving too much information, she had to be in another department in our hospital for another reason during the day. She happened to say to the nurse that was there, I can't believe I have to take this medicine every two hours. And the nurse looked at the bottle and looked at the patient and immediately made a phone call to the pharmacy. What had happened was the drug name, the dose said every 12 hours, but the sticker that was placed over the bottle, she covered up the one. The one. Oh, yeah. Oh my, God. oh my goodness. Yeah. It was pretty darn scary. And this woman's pretty with it, and she takes her meds as she's supposed to. I said, didn't that, didn't you question it? She said, it was a new prescription right. for my blood pressure that the doctor was trying me on. So no, she said, I... I didn't think that every two hours would be an abnormal amount. Right. And sometimes, too, I think what's happened is we trust the people to do their job. And it's not that they're trying not to do their <coughs> job, right. but odd things like that mm -hmm. can happen. And so we just kind of leave in this blissful cloud of trust. Yeah. Anyway, so the nurse that was caring for her made a phone call to the pharmacy reported it to that person's supervisor so that now everyone's aware. You wow. Know, that was yeah. a very close call. That is such a close yeah, call. I've never seen that one before. <laughs> no, and that that's an amazing thing to, yeah. to assume. <clears throat> oh my goodness. That was a good cat. And you know, because of your prior experiences, you had brought up to me that just because a patient says they're taking certain medications and you get home to their house and you're like, well, what about all these other ones? Oh yeah, I take those too. Mm -hmm. You know, it's very selective memory sometimes. And so, yeah, we do the best we can, but I've been pondering your, what you brought up mm -hmm. and how we can yeah. help with that. What were you going to say, Kathy? Um, I understand that you can provide some pharmacy services to staff, to employees. They can, can they get medication from you? Like, they need a aspirin for a headache or something? Yeah, like if that. it's an over-the-counter medication, they can come down and get it. If it's, I forgot my metoprolol all this morning, can't do it. But if it's like over the counter stuff and they want to come down, have them just run downstairs and and we can give it to them. Because oh, it turns out over the counter, no matter what, is the purview of pharmacy, inpatient, around patient. So, yeah. Um, lately, I've been hearing a lot more about supplements, mm -hmm. and um, and uh, there was a woman in Lander who was extremely healthy. She was actually a trainer at a gym and she was only 40 some years old, but she had been taking supplements, especially selenium, 
and apparently had an incredible high amount of selenium in her system and passed away. Is there any way or some kind of guideline or how do you know what's acceptable as a supplement and what's not? That's a really good question. So um, the FDA, first and foremost, you should know that supplements are not regulated by the FDA. That was pulled um, out of the FDA's purview, oh gosh, how many years ago? 12 to 15 years ago. So the only time the FDA can get involved is when a supplement puts what has already been deemed an active pharmaceutical ingredient into their supplement, and then the FDA can come in with, you know, guns a blazing and say, you can't do this. So supplements are natural things. There's lots of natural things in the world that can kill us. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of our medications come from natural sources. Digoxin comes from foxglove. So if you go eat a foxglove plant, um, you're going to end up in the ER. So the reality is that most of the things that are put into supplements, yes, they're natural. There is a dose limit on most things. You can try to Google um, that information. Uh, sometimes if the FDA uh, has done some study, that, so there's a list called the GRAS list, G-R-A-S, the generally recognized as safe list. Um, that's a list of, of a variety of things that the FDA has actually looked at and done some studies on, and some of those things are found in supplements, but not all things in supplements are on that list. And so, when you are a supplement, I actually have a friend uh, whose husband produces supplements. And he can produce whatever he wants and he can put whatever he wants into those little gel capsules and he can sell it as long as he's not lying about what's in it, as long as he is not making claims that it can do anything more than, than um, prior studies have done. But he does not have to run any studies whatsoever on safety or efficacy. So you're going to have supplements out there that you can do that people are just like, well, this says it is good for heart health. It's not claiming to solve any problem, it's just saying it's good for heart health. So that can be interpreted in any number of ways. I'm not necessarily against supplements because I think there's a number of things that can be gained from it, but it's a minefield. So I would get some recommendations from physicians. I would say, have you ever tried this? I have personally seen serotonin syndrome produced in two separate individuals because of the sheer number and quantity of the different types of supplements they were choosing to take. Serotonin syndrome is not a very fun thing to have, but we usually associate it with taking uh, far too many antidepressants or drugs of that nature. These people weren't on anything like that. They kept taking supplements like crazy. Um, there are people now, it's coming out in some of the literature, that um, the concentration of certain of these chemicals, uh, like if you read on the side of like biotin, I was looking this morning on the side of my little biotin capsule, which I think I'm taking for hair and nails, we'll find out. So, <laughs> just so you know. In pharmacy school, they give you one semester of this class and you come out more confused than you went in. So, um, it says I'm getting 1,667% of the FDA um, recommended daily allowance. Do I really need 1,667%? But keep in mind, what's the filter to your body? When you take things orally, what's your filter? Your liver is your filter. Mm -hmm. And they're now finding that there are some instances of liver cancer from high supplement use because, quite frankly, you're clogging up your liver. And so, and with such high concentrations, and you do it every single day, you're not giving your liver a break. And so we have to just be really cautious. I'm not saying they're wrong, they're not. I take some of them too. But I'm saying that, um, We've got to look at the percentages on the outside. It's so easy to overdo something nowadays because we always think more is better. So just be cautious, do your reading. Um, I would definitely go talk to, if you can find one, a pharmacist that, that knows a little bit about that. But to be honest with you, it's, it's something that we, we know a little bit about. We have a couple of resources, but there's hardly any data, hardly any data at all. Because these aren't proprietary molecules, who's going to spend two million dollars on a study when they when anybody else can also use that same ingredient? Mm -hmm. So that kind of makes sense, right? Mm -hmm. Well, isn't it also true on supplements that there's no uh, oversight as far as how much is in each pill? Right. 
Yeah, so exactly. you can get a huge dose in one pill and next to nothing in the next pill you take. Yeah, that's true. And I think I think that's a very concerning thing. Although here's the good news. So my friend's husband ended up in jail because <laughs> <laughs> because he 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 was ignoring the FDA who told him you cannot put a pharmaceutical ingredient in it. And he was adding a pharmaceutical ingredient into it. And so at least at some point when the FDA hears about those kind of things, they research them and they clamp down on it. But that could be dangerous. What if what if the patient was on on that already? And when they say they're natural. Well that's yet, nice. Everything you, is. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm looking at the ingredient and you're right. wondering where is the source of this well, that's true. natural ingredient. That's true. And you have to look too because on different plants, it depends, like if they're the stems, it's different concentration than if it's the flower or if it's the leaves or if it's the roots. And so there's that concern too. Although what I've found is sometimes when you have questions like that and you get into it on the internet, there's some total nerd that's done the, the research for you. <laughs> and you're like, aha, maybe he knows what he's talking about. Hopefully he has some references down here. And then, um, and that way you can decide if that's, if that's something you want to take. Mm -hmm. So, yay, thanks for coming. That was a blast. <laughs> I hope it was.